Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, back in the overflow room, here to talk to you about this amazing 21 CD set on Brilliant Classics, the Viola da Gamba edition. Holy mackerel. I have to be honest. I have had a conflicted relationship with the Viola da Gamba. Now, what is a viola da gamba? Well, a gamba is a leg, so it's a leg viola. In other words, it is the ancestor, as you can see from this lovely photo, there it is. It is the ancestor of the cello. The only member of the gamba family that is still in use today is the double bass. That is actually a gamba. Everything else is a member of the violin family, which is slightly different. I mean, it's just kind of different. I can talk to you about the differences, but I don't really think it's terribly important. I mean, there they are. You can see them. There are the differences. Anyway, um, I'm sure some of you will chime in about this. Now, I was never an early or Baroque music person, much as I love a lot of it. You know, I've learned a lot since and back in the day. But when I was just starting out, I hadn't a clue about most of this stuff. And I was... My entire exposure to the viola da gamba was through Bach, his three gamba sonatas, which I thought sounded marvelous, absolutely marvelous. But then I started listening to the French gamba people, like Marine Marais and Michel Corrette and Antoine Fauqueray. And oh my God, the damn thing, it sounds like a dying cow. It just goes... I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Here, listen to this. Here's a typical example of a saraband by Michel Corrette. <coughs> See what I mean? It sounds like a cow, doesn't it? It's ridiculous. And then as I started to go through earlier music, I realized that violas, violas da gamba, and viols generally, the family, were more cattle-like than I even knew, because they came in herds. These herds were called a consort, and they were called that because really it was a herd. And, you know, when you had a herd of viols, what you had was the ability to make contrapuntal stuff happening, by using lots and lots of imitation to that sort of dyspeptic mooing that was their natural mode of utterance. Here is, here is a little piece for viola consort. I'm not going to disgrace the name of the composer, but you'll hear exactly what I mean as the voices enter separately. It sounds like a herd of dying cows. Here it is. <laughs> See what I mean? So that's the viola da gamba. And I have to say, I was not, not dissuaded from this opinion of the instrument when I was uh, president of the Khan Classical Awards and that unbelievably boring movie came out. Remember, it was called Tous les Matins du Monde. Oh my God, was this a French piece of trash. It was the dullest thing I've ever seen in my life. And of course, the soundtrack which consisted entirely of viol pieces by a second-rate French Baroque viol composer named Monsieur de Saint-Colomb. That soundtrack sold like 30 trillion copies in Europe. Unbelievable. It was played, the viol music, the dying cow, was performed by, by Jordi Saval. And actually, I have here Jordi Saval doing... Music for the Viol by Monsieur de saint Colomb le Fils and Marine Marais. And, oh my God. So, so I had to go see a special screening of this, of this movie. And as the chairman of the jury of the Cannes Classical Awards, I, of course, had a, a position of some eminence when I was there. I mean, I was invited to sit in the front row, right in the middle, right next to Jordi Saval for this special screening. And they showed it at exactly noon, because it was just before lunch. 
And they started it at around noon in this private theater screening thing that was totally full. And there I was in the front. And noon happens to be, as some of you may know, if it's noon in France, it's 6 a.m. in New York. And this was the second day I was there. And I was dying of jet lag. I was exhausted. And this unbelievably dreary movie comes on and I immediate fell, immediately fell asleep next to Mr. Saval and started snoring loudly. And I can only tell you it was not one of my finer moments. And what really bothered me about that movie, what I remember of seeing it, is that nothing happens Nothing happens at all. All I know is it's one of those movies where everyone dresses in incredibly lavish costumes and they drive around in carriages and they have powdered wigs and the women have little fake beauty marks and cleavage out to here and, and hoop skirt things. And they can't even fit in the doorway and they walk into these dark rooms and they sit around and talk about the meaning of art. It was Oh, God, what I wouldn't have given for, like, Star Wars Part 5. Anything. Oh, God, it was killing me. So I was asleep through the whole thing. This did not endear me to the viola da gamba, and I'm sure that the performers on the viola da gamba were, da gamba were not too thrilled about me. And I don't blame them, frankly, because I tried to be considerate of these things, but I, I just couldn't. I was exhausted. What was I supposed to do? So it was only many, many years later that I began to awaken to the subtle, and I do mean subtle, charms of the instrument. It turns out that the reason that Bach's viola da gamba music is so much better is that he used a better viola da gamba that he invented himself. Well, he bred it himself. It was called a Holstein. And the Holstein viola da gamba had a much better sound than the normal French stringy sounding Mukal viola da gamba. And so, you know, let me just let me just get to the bottom of it. It's an acquired taste, isn't it? So many things are, but boy, this really is. If you're lucky, when you have solo viola da gamba sonatas, you'll have a really pushy harpsichord player who drowns the whole thing out. And then it's much, much more enjoyable because they double the melody anyway. And it depends what kind of viola da gamba you have and in what in what register the composer writes and what the tuning is. I think a equals 650 should get the pitch up enough to make it tolerable. But anyway, I'm going to go through all 21 CDs of this set so you can see what you get in the marvelous, brilliant classics, Viola da Gamba edition. Unbelievable, isn't it? It's the only set of CDs I know that gives milk. And if you really don't like it, you can always grill it later. So anyway, let's see what's in here, shall we? And we have some samples we can listen to as well. It's not oh, the excitement is just building. That's incredible. It's enough to cause a stampede. All right, so you get the little booklet. It tells you all about the Viola da Gamba. Aren't you glad you know? Okay, there we go. Ready? CD1. <clears throat> Here it is. John Dowland, Lacrimé. Well, that happens to be marvelous. It's a masterpiece. I did a whole video on Lacrimé. I mean, it happens to be written for an extremely attractive herd of gambas. And it, it's lovely music. It's sad, mostly. You know, Dowland was always droopy. And the performers are, are let's see, um, a bunch of people. The, the well, it doesn't really tell you who they are. Well, it tells you who they all are. But it's not a group. And it's a very good group. It's, they're led off by Miguel Rincon Rodriguez on the lute, because this is really lute music. It just happens to have a batch of viola de gambas attached to it. But music soothes the savage beast, and so that's very nice. I mean, they're very soothed. Okay, lacrime next. All right, this is stuff by Diego Ortiz, who lived, lived from 1530 to 1570, and Silvestro de Ganassi dal Fontego, who lived from 1492 to 1550. And this is performed by Modo Antiquo. And again, uh, and let's see, Bettina Hoffman, who plays, what does she play? The bass and soprano viols. Now, the soprano viol is a much more appealing instrument. It sounds like a veal. It's sort of like the, it's a calf. It's, it's the veal of the viol family. So if you like veal, you will like the soprano viol. The bass viol, on the other hand, oh dear. 
Now we're really talking about the dying cow version of the viola da gamba. But that's okay. I mean, you know, this is music that is completely obscure, and you may or may not like it. It's all it's all early contrapuntal based on on sort of vocal polyphony, kind of richer carré fugal things. That's what it is. And that's all you need to know about it. Ah, Purcell, the complete fantasias. Now, Purcell was the last guy to write for the herd of vials because they went out of style with amazing quickitude in the latter half of the 17th century. So this is one of the last works. They are masterpieces. Everybody thinks so. And who am I to challenge that? Actually, they're very, very beautiful. And here we have Musica Amphion on period instruments, naturally. They dug them up from the Siberian permafrost, original herd of vials. And here is a little bit of the Fantasia upon one note. Fascinating work. Listen to the piercing dissonances in the contrapuntal voices. This is really great music, guys. Here you go. <laughs> Charmant, isn't it? Okay, yes, it's a little lead-footed, but it's a herd. What do you expect? All right, CD4. What is this? Uh, oh, Michel Corret. This is his Sonatas, Opus 20, Les Delices de la Solitude. The Delights of Solitude, because let me tell you something. After you listen to these things, you're just going to want to go somewhere and bury your head. No, it's not, it's not that bad. They're, they're, they're solo viol pieces of the type we heard quite a bit of in Tous les Matins du Monde. And if you like that sort of thing, then you will like CD number four. CD number five. Ah, Bach. Here we go. Bach on the Holstein Viola da Gamba. His three excellent, excellent Gamba sonatas here played by by Patsy Montero, Viola da Gamba, and Daniele Boccaccio on the organ instead of the harpsichord. Actually, they work quite well that way. It's, it's, it, they're, they're lovely performances. CD number six. Ah, number six. Johannes Schenk, who lived around 1660 until sometime after 1716, although nobody knows how much after. He got stomped to death by his herd. And these are, let's see, uh, this is, these are some sonatas per performed by, let's see, the, uh, someone on the viola da gamba, a theorbo, a harpsichord, and also a cello. Remember that? And then you get to compare the two. But the, the soloist, the group is called the Recondita Armonia Ensemble. Now, I always thought that Recondita Armonia was an aria from Tosca. I may be missing something. I don't know, but now it's an early music group. I wonder if Puccini knew that. Yeah. Or Tosca, for that matter. Ah, now we get to Marin Marais. Yes, the greatest composer for the viol in the entire French Baroque era. And let's see, this is his piece de viol, piece, his viol pieces, book five. And you get all of book five. There's like tons of stuff. It consists of a whole batch of suites. And let me play you a little bit of this. It's, it's, the music's lovely. It really is. Here is a bit of the Saraband from the suite number one. It's just beautiful music, as you'll agree.
to have a more perky bovine festivity, we get the, the let's see, the grand gavotte. And grand and gavottish it certainly is. Here you are. Lovely stuff. Absolutely lovely stuff. And so the next few discs, let's see, CD 7, 8, 9, that's all Marin Marais. And then we get number, let's see, number 10 is Marin Marais. It's so wonderful when you can go through these quickly, isn't it? Ah, wait, wait, wait. Then we have a piece called La Voix de Viol, consisting of bits of things. Oh, who's playing Marin Marais? Do we care? Well, maybe we do. Let's see, it's Reiner Zepperling, Viola da Gamba, Gislaine, Gislaine Walters, and, oh, Peter Jan Belder, our fabulous Scarlatti harpsichordist. Peter Jan Belder, thank you for being there and drowning everyone else out. Just kidding. He doesn't, but he's so good. And then there's a, a, a narrator in numbers 17 and 18 here, which is, oh, yes, the, the Tableau de Préparation de la Taille and some other things. Which, uh, who knows what that is? Um, it doesn't make any difference. All right. Uh, let's see. Then we get, let's see, CD 11. The Voice of the Viol with Robert de Vis, more Marin Marais, and the Angelo Michel Bartolotti, and, and Gaspar Leroux. And it's just, oh, it's a whole selection of, of vile stuff. So, you know. At this point, you've made it to CD11 and you're in love with the herd, then you, you go for it. Next, we get Ah, Michel, and Antoine, the Forquere family. Now, the Forquere family was a big deal. There were a bunch of them. The most famous one is Antoine Forquere, and he lived from 1672 to 1745. His music is actually a lot more sort of eruptive than the much smoother sounds of Corette and 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 uh, Marais. It's more like, you know, he's more like at a rodeo. Although I have to confess, I remember reading about that, saying Forquere is a violent mannerist composer. So I went out and bought scads of Forquere CDs, and I put them on, and what did I hear? <laughs> yes, what could I tell you? It is what it is, even if it's Forquere. So that was Forquere, and there's Antoine and Michel, and on one disc of this, and then there's, let's see, who's next? Uh, oh, Jean-Baptiste Forquere, and a bunch of Forquere's. So you've got a couple discs of the Forquere family. Then we have Auguste Cunel, who lived from 1643 to 1790 or thereabouts, and these are a selection of viola da gamba sonatas. And they're very German. You know, one of them is is based on uh, Herr Jesus Christ du Hoch des Gut. So it's kind of like, you know, if you want to hear a Bach cantata sung by a cow, then there you go. You're in business. All right, next. Oh, this is a fun couple, a bunch of discs. This is Telemann. Now, Telemann was smart. Why? 
because Telemann liked to write for interesting combinations of instruments. And it's one of the peculiarities of the viola da gamba that it actually blends very well with other things. In fact, usually when it's with other things, you don't even hear it. And that's what's so wonderful about it. So you hear the other things and we're all happy and content. So we've got, let's see, uh, sonatas for violin and bass viol with basso continuo. So, you know, they're for violin, and they're really nice. <laughs> they're for a violin. Thank God they're for violin. Then we get sonatas for flute and bass viol, which sound remarkably like the sonatas for violin, except instead of a violin, you have a flute, which is all right by me. And then we have, let's see, tell them on more, sonatas for oboe and treble viol with Basso Continuo, which have an oboe. Yes, yes, yes. Telemann knew what he was doing. These are all very enjoyable, slight, slight, pleasing works that you can put on and, you know, just relax and dip into them whenever you feel like it. Then we have concertos and overtures by Telemann in a symphonia, all of them with viola da gamba, but I mean, you know, come on, you've got oboe, two coronets, three trombones, two violins, viola, and basso continuo. And then we have like a, a concerto for bass, viol, and orchestra. And then there's one for recorder, viola da gamba, and strings, and one for viola da gamba, transverse flute, and strings. So, you know, the more you mix it up, the happier we all will be. So those are in enjoyable. And quite frankly, if they deserve to be here. It's fascinating to see that in this collection, you really do get a wonderful overview of all the things you can do with the viola da gamba. I mean, you know, you can get milk out of it, or you can, you can make a steak out of it, or you can turn it into a leather couch covering or a rug. I mean, it's just an incredibly versatile instrument. It really is. Uh, more Telemann concertos. Okay, so you know what we're in for. They have viola da gamba, and that's uh, basically all you need to know about those. And then it's on CD20, Rameau, the pièce de clavecin en concert. These are lovely works. Everybody enjoys them. They are masterpieces of the Baroque period. They are basically keyboard pieces with the participation of others. And the others are Baroque violin and the viola da gamba. And this is again, Musica Amphion. They're very well done. They're a very good group. That's an excellent, excellent disc of really marvelous music. Because Rameau was just great and everything he wrote is really worth listening to. And then we get Jacques Morel, the complete music for viola da gamba. And he lived from 1700 to 1749, by which time the viola da gamba was on its way out because France was rapidly becoming vegetarian. And so that was the end of the herd of viola da gamba. It was gone after that, and that is CD 21. So let me just say, this is obviously a collection for aficionados, but in a sense, if you're really curious about this stuff and you wanna hear the whole range of repertoire, everything the instrument could do, it's really a great, a great set to have. Whether or not you'll keep it depends on what phase of record collecting you're in. If you're in the, the exploration or quest or crusade phase where you're on the search, on the hunt for new stuff and new experiences, this may be just the ticket. On the other hand, if you're in the next phase, you may be getting rid of it. It really depends, and you know where you are in that process. So I hope you've enjoyed this little disquisition on the viola da gamba and other barnyard instruments. Keep on listening, folks. Thank you, and take care.